our first uh, panelist for this uh, particular um, panel. Um, her name is um, Chaplain Samsia Abdul Majid. She is a board certified um, by the Association of Professional Chaplains, Board of Chaplaincy Certification Incorporated, with endorsement by the Islamic Society of North America. She serves in a palliative care at a medical center in Westchester, New York. Chaplaincy, her spiritual calling, is a natural continuum of the ideals of the United Nations, where she worked previously. A former board member of the Association of Muslim Chaplains, AMC, she continues to serve as a co-investigator on two joint research initiatives of AMC and Boston School, Boston University School of Medicine. Chaplain Samsia holds a master's in Islamic studies and Christian Muslim relations and graduate certificate in Islamic chaplaincy, both from Hartford Seminary in Connecticut and also an MBA from Assumption University in Thailand. She is a grandmother to a joyous three-year-old. And joining her for this conversation um, entitled uh, In a State of Hope, My Son Died Alone. Joining her um, is Sandra Haji Ahmed, who is an executive coach and organizational development consultant, serving individuals, managers, and teams in United Nations agencies and related entities. She completed her coaching certification at Columbia University and is a graduate of the New School University and Vassar College. She is a devoted mother, grandmother, enjoys writing poetry, and engages in activities that bring people closer together. Um, so please give your undivided attention. Again, my name is Dr. Camila Rashad. I'm the founder and president of Muslim Wellness Foundation and the founding director of the Black Muslim COVID Coalition. So really, it is my honor to facilitate this panel with incredible speakers. And so I want to welcome Chaplain Sincia and Sister Sandri Haji Ahmed. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. <clears throat> Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Thank you to the organizers of this conference who have put a lot of effort into bringing us together. I am Samsia Abdul Majid. I'm a palliative care chaplain in New York, about 45 minutes north of Manhattan in Westchester. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, thank you for inviting me here today, uh, Samsia. I am Sandra Haji Ahmed, uh, the mother of Jamal Haji Ahmed. Um, Jamal died of COVID um, on the 9th of April uh, this year, the same night that over a thousand people uh, succumbed uh, to the virus in New York that, that day. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you so much for agreeing to share a very personal experience with us. <clears throat> this case study, um, the title is In Hope, My Son Died Alone. We'll highlight three things. One, the experience of a parent navigating the healthcare system in time of a pandemic. Two, the intentional healing journey that Sandra has taken and continue to pursue towards hope. And three, the emotional and spiritual support from a chaplain before, during, and after Jamal's death. As companion journeying with you, Sandra, through your hope, your despair, and ultimately, submission. Your generosity will help us, healthcare professionals, patients, families, and uh, parents, friends alike, to learn how compassion looks like, how it feels like, and what happens when it doesn't happen. And we will also see how you yourself develop your muscle of resilience. Yes. As it happened, I'm witness to hope, and I like to think not as a distant observer, but as one who is involved with compassion and with openness to your stories. In the process, I was hoping to alleviate your suffering and to rejoice at your successes. 
Inshallah. Inshallah. So Sandra, before you and I offer our reflections and discuss some takeaways, what would you like us to know about Jamal? Well, this is our beautiful Jamal, our son, our brother, um, our friend. Um, I'd like to introduce him with a story. Uh, when he was a youngster, uh, he was the person in the family who was full of stories. He was a very people person. Um, he loved to play. He loved to, he would mimic things. He was, he was really out there. Uh, and he also has a twin brother who was just the opposite um, in those days. He was but a bit of a bookworm. So we called Jamal our Minister of External Affairs and we called his brother Kamal the Minister of the Interior. Uh, although later on in life, um, he became uh, a much more quiet um, adult. But uh, Jamal, Jamal's name itself, Jamal meaning the, the one who is enjoyable to others. He was really a person uh, to be enjoyed. Um, he had a wonderful capacity for love. Um, he was a caring soul. He was kind, he was gentle. He's a bit shy, uh, laid back, a very spiritual person. I would say he was a dreamer. He was a talented musician. He played the classical clarinet. He loved sports and he also loved good food. Uh, Jamal was born in Kenya, but grew up in Westchester, New York, and attended for some time um, Arizona State University. Um, as a person growing up, he was well-traveled uh, with the family. He's, he's been to, to Kenya, to the UK, to France, to Norway, Canada, uh, Trinidad and Tobago. So really um, somebody who has seen something of the world. But in his 20s, um, he had to endure challenges brought about by a mental illness. And he spent almost four and a half years in a nursing home. And he was supposed to be released from that home in April 2020 to start a new life. And so there it, was his hope. So it took um, quite a few years of working the system before it, and a, before an appropriate place was found? It, it very much did. It was a very big challenge. As you know, the system sometimes is biased against people of color, against um, certainly um, black persons of color, Muslims. So, so there were many frustrations along the way, but we were finally, finally getting somewhere. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of hope uh, in the earlier part of this year that things were getting so much better for him. So he was on the cusp of a new beginning when it happened. Yes, he was. In fact, he contracted COVID in the nursing home in March, and that was, you know, total devastating, very, very devastating. In fact, the nursing home didn't even tell us that that's what was happening. There was a sort of a blackout on the news and on the communication. Um, so when we heard about this and we got a call saying they're taking him to the ER, at first we felt, okay, well, you know, he's 28, he's young, so there are hopes for his recovery. And our faith in Allah, you know, it's very strong. We felt, okay, he will be protected. And we were pretty, you know, we were worried, but we, we, we were worried with optimism. And we felt the doctors, hopefully they knew what they were doing, they would take good care of him. Sadly, his survival was in danger and he was very alone. We felt in a time of critical need. Um, soon after he arrived at the ER, he was intubated. A uh, couple of days later, five days later, his condition really began to deteriorate. Uh, the medical staff were overwhelmed. There was very little communication with us. We kept hearing, well, he's stable, or oh, you know, he has a fever. Um, but there was not, uh, we didn't have a very complete picture of really what was going on. We had, of course, the news all around us because so many people were dying at that time. Mm. And it was not known to us whether our prayers and messages that we asked the medical uh, personnel to convey to him, we didn't know whether anybody actually did that. Mm. We, we, we hoped and we prayed that they did. Yeah. 
so um so that the unknown the the not knowing and the fact that you couldn't visit there was a time when visitors were not allowed right that's right yeah that's right so you were desperate and the thought that comes to my mind is um like our mother hajar who was running between marwa and safa so yes. Was, yes desperate looking for help and then also looking for anyone like yourself you your, yourself looking for someone in the vicinity to hear you to hear that you yearn to know about jamal your son the person more than a patient how he was doing and is anyone sees and cares for him that way yeah so in 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 a sense you know we 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 felt okay jamal is not just a patient i mean he's <laughs> our son he's he's a human being and we we were we were not we we were sort of guessing as to whether or not he was being taken care of in the way in the manner in which we would have wanted to um had we been able to be there as well um i did uh, uh write um some poetry recently and and i wanted to read from jamal's voice um an excerpt from a poem called in hope so this is jamal's voice speaking so so many ways i thought of how to help you see me the real me inside my silence when the world was too fast too hard imploding is it too late to vote to become a lawyer i could be so good you know or a neurologist imagine can you see me healing those folks can you see me as somebody a real body what can you see those words sandra hmm. silence implosion can you see me the powerful words and how does that relate to his uh, to his death what was pretty uh, it was devastating i remember getting the call from the hospitalist saying that uh, they couldn't find a pulse um the whole experience of that conversation was it was a bit abrupt and once again the question was so who do you see do you see jamal as 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 jamal or do you is he just you know another patient in that ward in that covid ward you know who is losing his life mm-hmm. um we were also of course faced with these different precautions that had to be in place um because of the pandemic and able to do normal rites of washing of even viewing and we had to adjust to new ways new ways to bury and new ways to mourn and i think jamal was the uh, the first person in our community to have died of covid so there was a lot of new things that we had to learn to do Well, thanks to you, Samsia. <laughs> it was uh, an occasion where we felt um, that you really came forward and you put yourself out for us as a sister. Um, you were you were there for us every step of the way, and we were able to to bury him uh, finally with dignity mm-hmm. and with the respect um, of our religion and what uh, and the love that we were seeking. So thank you. Thank you. Glad that was there. So I I was always curious, you know, about what you felt. I remember, you know, when I when I called you and 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 first told you that he'd been taken to the ER. You know. Mm. You know, how 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 did you take all of this? Um <clears throat> well, we have so many points of intersections. We are mothers, we are friends. we have emotional and spiritual relationship my prayer for jamal over the years of his striving has always been for recovery and healing and when you told me that he had been taken to the emergency room my prayer was for him to have ease and for you to be spared of losing another child Mm. Yeah. So I wanted to create space for you to reflect 
to recount, to scream. And as you spoke about not knowing about the absence of communication, the perfunctory way of communicating and telling you mere statistics about his temperature, his um, blood pressure, and not the person of Jamal, <clears throat> I felt a lot of dismay. I felt angry. I was angry at the situation, at the clinicians, at the nurses, from whom you felt no compassion. I was also afraid for you. You had used the word traumatized to me. And I know that a difficult, unsupported time of death is difficult, potent, difficult healing for family members. So I was afraid for you. Then I felt guilt. I know how hardworking the healthcare professionals are and the kind of condition under which they're operating. Even before the pandemic, there was a lot of moral distress caused by the inability to provide the kind of care that they want to provide. So, during the, pande the, during the pandemic itself, to use your words in one of our conversations, you said, it's like a tsunami. All the physicians, the nurses, all the healthcare workers, family, institutions, they are all overwhelmed by the tsunami. We are all suffering and we were all suffering in different ways. We still are. Part of my suffering was suffering of divided loyalty to you as a friend whom I was helping, am helping as a chaplain and to the healthcare profession to which I belong. With all those feelings inundating me, my overriding concern nonetheless was how can I be of help to you to ease your burden to accompany you. My prayer was and continue to be Ya Rab, Ya Wadud, Ya Rahman, Ya Rahim. Show me the way. Let me be present with Sandra. Are you still awesome, Sia? Thank you. And on, on the day when you, you, I noticed you called at Pajar and I saw that you had called and my heart shrank, sank, it's not a good sign. How are you now, Sandra? I'm still climbing the mountain. It's getting much easier. Um, there's more light. There's solace in, in prayer. Had, we've had a wonderful um, comfort from family, from friends. We continue to sort out Jamal's legacy and give praise. We thank Allah for the time that he is with us. And we're really looking out for um, his brother. And I want to read you part of an, another poem that I wrote about him. And this is his voice. It's called In Release. It's time to let me go. Let me show you the lanterns of heaven the hollow holds in the cosmos of forever here. Take my hand, it's, it's my turn to comfort the living. Prepare the way for old time laughter. You need to feel I am okay, warm, secure. I thrive in freedom from the future, like a firefly brushing your hand. You look worn in that shabby coat. Mine is gone, or I'd cover you with leaves and clover, lightness and crystal, alas, it's time I went, a time of prayer. The stars, the angels are calling my name. The poem, it's my turn to comfort the living. That's where <laughs> Jamal would like us to go, right? I think so. And I think you are the one giving comfort at the individual level you are reminding us that we may not get the assistance we need when we need them. 
and it is a lonely, despairing journey. And we will show the, the brunt of it alone. Nonetheless, seek help and know that Allah is close by. Climbing the mountain, by its very nature, is not easy. However, the benefits, benefits of clarity and benefits of perspective. You show us how to build and nurture relations and connections. You connect with Jamal through poetry, to God, through friends and family and you develop rituals. I know from our other conversations that you take walks, you journal, and of course you pray, and you exercise gratitude for every blessings. Jamal's death is a reminder of your and our own mortality. So you are I don't see an app for that. You'll need to download one. You show us how to build resilience. Thank you, Samsia. So I think just to just to close um, with with a with a word of hope, hope that we can heal with compassion, that we can continue working for open communication and information, that really that we can provide comfort before, during, and after. And here's where you, as a chaplain, uh, are, are so essential. And perhaps there's a need, as you mentioned, to educate and mentor health professionals in compassionate care. I leave you with Jamal's last text as he was being taken in the ambulance uh, to the emergency room. He said, Mom, I hope it works itself out. He used the word hope. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. You know, just being privy to that conversation and the reflections that you both had um, on Jamal's life and also his inspiring words that, you know, I hope it works itself all out um, is very moving. Um, and so, you know, I'm incredibly grateful to, and I'm sure all of our viewers are also incredibly grateful to have witnessed this conversation.